Megan, good morning. Megan Hyde, speech pathologist here at Flinders Medical Centre. Um, Megan, we're talking about motor neurone disease and I know that you're a member of the multidisciplinary team here at the MND Clinic. Can you tell me a little bit about the role of speech pathologists and, and what you do? So the role of speech pathology working with MND generally would cover communication and swallowing and our role in, in the swallowing disorders team with the MND clinic, we're not able to follow, to concentrate on the communication side of things as much, so we rely on our colleagues in the community for that side of things. But um, we look at swallow function and safe oral intake. We look at assessing and educating people with MND to see how their swallow is changing, explain what might cha happen into the future, which is always a bit of a difficult um, mm conversation, conversation mm. to have, mm. talk about how we might adapt to those changes. The aim is really to reduce the effects of the swallowing difficulties on the patient as things change. So we don't want them to become dehydrated, malnourished, constipated because they're eating less or drinking less. We don't want them to um, be concerned about uh, developing a chest infection because things are going down the wrong way or... Um, or choking, which is a concern that people have, but is often not something that physically happens. But there's a lot of people who feel that they have had choking episodes or are having choking episodes, either because of um, symptoms like laryngospasm, where it's triggered a, a vocal fold spasm to protect their airway, or food residue in their throat, or coughing because something's going down the wrong way. So looking at trying to reduce those uncomfortable and scary symptoms so that people can eat more comfortably and that's a big part of our job is to basically try and find what people want to eat and try and and help and marry that with with their swallow function so how do we help you eat what you enjoy or how do we modify what you're enjoying so that it's more comfortable and safe to eat wow so that in itself is a um Lots of pros and cons to be thinking about, and, and I guess you have to get to know your, your clients and what their yeah. wants and wishes are. And it's a real balance. It's not there's not one answer that's always right. So speech pathology might assess someone's swallow and say, "Here's the diet consistency I think you should be on." But unless we can bring you with me, <laughs> so if I can, if I can't bring you with me to to understanding why I would like that consistency food or for the rationale behind it, you're not you're not coming. You're going to go home and have your sausages and steak you know so it's sort of discuss and and if I'm not listening to you saying I'm managing steak telling you that your tongue's weak or your swallow's got you're getting lots of residue on our assessments and your throat there's 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 no point you know we have to we have to work, work together it's it's a very um yeah we, ha we have to we have to work with our with our clients to to get what they need. A negotiation. A negotiation, <laughs> that's exactly what it is. It's definitely not about what I want and, and, and I'm continually surprised at what people can manage despite their difficulties. Some people can have almost no tongue movement and still be able to swallow a relatively normal diet. So how do they get around that? You know, are they, you know, your tongue's so important in chewing. How do you chew without being able to move the food around your mouth and form a, a bolus? How do you get it back into your throat? You know, so people use gravity. They use their finger. They use their cutlery. They use a mouthful of drink. They, you know, there's lots of ways, and we just need to try and make sure that those ways are not putting them at risk. Really, is that that's our concern? So, does everybody experience swallowing difficulties? So the people who present with swallowing difficulties first are often the people with bulbar onset MND. Uh -huh. um, so for them, speech and swallowing are often the first indicators of, of the MND. Um, for others, it may come later in the, in the progression. And for some people, it's, 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 swallowing is not an issue at all, but feeding can be an issue because of physical disability. The flail arm variant, you might not be able to feed yourself because you can't move your arms. So oh. you need someone to, to mm. feed you <laughs> or to help you. And then there's all of those, the risks of choking and aspiration that come with being fed, even though you're not dysphagic. So um, not everybody presents with dysphagia. I th understand it's about 80% by the end of, of the progression of the MND illness, but um, almost all people with bulbar onset MND will have 
early dysphagic So it's pretty likely that a speech pathologist will be involved in your care team um, at some point. Yep. Um, And it's sounding to me like with very positive effects and results if you get in there early. We like to think so. (laughs) (laughs) Definitely. We talked earlier about the need for early referral, so I think we've covered that pretty well. Um, I guess my own only thought about that early referral is um, that some people don't know how to describe and explain the changes that are happening that are happening with their swallow or they'll minimize their symptoms so as a gp working with someone in the community and trying to work out when do i refer you probably need to ask more than just how's your swallowing going it probably needs to be um are there foods you're avoiding because they're difficult to swallow are meals taking longer are you eating less because it's difficult um are you coughing when you drink? Are you losing weight? Those sorts of questions give us a lot more information than, than just how's your swallow going if, if people aren't really wanting or So there's nothing, nowhere for them to hide if you ask yeah, a little suite bit, of questions. Yeah. And yes. sometimes you might find your patient minimising things but their husband, wife, daughter saying, yes, but. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, you're still managing a normal diet except that time when, that, when you were coughing last week or... Um, when we were giving you, you know, back blows, or we've stopped, you've stopped eating nuts because they're tricky, you know. So they sort okay. of people, your your people know what's going on. So you're getting threads of information, yeah. and you're pulling that assessment and that picture together. And then you're together saying, you know what? I think we need speech pathology to be involved to be having a look at your swallow and getting a baseline of where things are at and thinking about where to from here. Yeah. Brilliant. So I think the other um, sorts of things to consider as um, when you're trying to decide who to refer to speech pathology could be thinking about the sort of early signs for people with MND and sort of early symptoms that we see are coughing with drinks, sensation of food sticking in the throat. Um, Our patients sort of at the first appointments will often um, specify that there are certain foods that they've started to avoid or they have difficulty with. Raw carrot is a big one. Nuts. Um, stodgy food like bread, stringy food like lettuce um, and salads, um, and really fibrous things like steak. Yeah, so those things, if those sorts of things are starting to come up, and time taken for meals, those sorts of things, that's a good time to start thinking. It's time for to to refer for more in speech, speech pathology. Yeah. So speech pathology, Megan, what what do you do? What what's your day look like? Yeah, so with patients with MND, we spend a lot of time getting a feel for how they feel about swallowing. So we've got some questionnaires that we get them to answer, so, you know, talking about what what's difficult, what's easy, what how that, their enjoyment, how long things are taking. We will assess people at just eating and drinking in the room with us, try and identify what's how things are looking and, and get a picture, a better picture of of how it looks from the outside. If we've got concerns about aspiration risk or, or residue and, and um, the pharyngeal function, we might refer for investigations. So through our team here, we can do uh, fees investigations, which is a scope through the nostril, looking down from above at, at the pharynx, which is similar to investigations ENTs do to look at your vocal folds. Or we might get you into the x-ray department to do a modified barium swallow or video fluoroscopy where we can put barium with food and drink to look at how, how it's going down. And that's a great way to have a look at aspiration risk. So often people who are managing their dysphagia in the community through their local speech pathologist will have referrals through to us for those investigations. And that helps it give us an idea of how things look now. We might be able to look again in six months and say, here's what's changed. So that's actually really helpful for future planning for what's changed, what's, where, where are we heading. Um, for decisions about uh, discussions about PEG, discussions about mod- diet modification strategies. We do a lot of um, looking at what strategies people can use to manage what they want to eat more safely. So it might be postural, might be ways of eating, slowing the rate, smaller mouthfuls, more reducing distractions so that you're not having a conversation while you're eating. Uh-huh. Um, and then we look at things like diet and fluid modifications. So we change the consistency of the food to make it easier to prepare orally or easier to get through your throat. We may look at ways of 
drinking that make things a bit easier or thickening the fluids to give you more time to get your swallow going or more time to get the, to cl- have an extra swallow to clear the residue. So we're looking at ways of trying to help you eat and drink more safely and more comfortably with a view to keeping up that nutrition. And then we're also discussing when you might be looking at considering a peg. Um, the other big thing we look at is oral care and secretion management. So we can look at strategies, um, products that can help with with relieving discomfort from secretion problems, um, and then liaising with the medical team about possibility of medications. So a lot of people have trouble with excess secretion, so it's quite runny, they might find they have drooling. It's not that they're producing extra secretions, we produce about two litres a day anyway, it's just that they're not as well managed, either through the swallow or lip control. Other people will talk about thick, sticky, tenacious secretions so they can't actually swallow them through because they're, they're, they're so sticky in their throat. And other people will talk about dry mouth. And many of our patients with MND will have a combination of the three, depending on what time of the day. So they might wake up dry, and then in the evening it's sticky, and <laughs> during the day they worry about drooling. So you can't just assume that one medication or one strategy is going to fix everything. It's just trying to get to get to the bottom of, of what the problem is and, and how we might be able to manage it. So it's a balancing Again, act it's a balancing again. act, yes. yes. And um, and we work very closely, you know, the respiratory doctors have got a lot of um, experience with thick, sticky secretions. Um, people like Dr Allcroft and the palliative care team have dealt with, you know, it's, it's dry mouth and saliva and, and discomfort from the area. They, they deal with that every day. So between us, there's a lot of... A lot of people with a lot of ideas of ways of managing it. And I guess speech pathology like to think we can sort of be the, the early people who can start looking at strategies and ways of managing things. And then once we get to the medication perspective, it's more the doctors take on. That. So it's really keeping people as, as well as they can for as long as they can be yeah. um, and delivering the support yeah. where they want it. Yeah, it's, it's developing relationships so that people that feel safe and comfortable to tell us what's actually going on and trust us to, to, to have their best interests at, our, at the heart of everything we do. You know? um, That's great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for this morning. Is there anything else that you would like to add before we come to the, the end of our time this morning? I think um, just making sure that... that People with MND, uh, we see it as being very important to work together as a team. You know, I don't think speech pathology can manage swallowing and nutrition without a dietitian. We can't start talking about a PEG without having someone like a gastroenterologist and respiratory to give us more information about how what that, what's involved with that. Um, and that goes the same in the community as well. Nobody can work on their own to manage MND. And we work very closely with the MND Association and um, uh, the the OTs, the the NDIS coordinators, um, MND Association is able to provide equipment for for our patients they would never be able to afford otherwise for those over you know those over 65 or even for those under 65 to have a trial and know what they what that what's appropriate for them and so um, without the MND Association, MND clinic, community colleagues it would be a very different picture, yeah. Okay, so it, it, what you're saying is it is a, a family. It is a family. It is a family. <laughs> it takes a family. It definitely well. takes a family and, and you know, I guess the mo- almost the most important people really. It's not us, it's this. It is the family. It's, it's the Absolutely. people at home, um, yeah. the neighbours, the friends, the husbands and wives and children, helping people to manage a, normal, a modified diet, to manage... Yeah, and be less feeding. anxious and, and more to be less anxious and to have that support and comfort. Yeah. yeah. Sounds like um, a very involved career path. Very rewarding too. Good. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Yeah, thank you.